All right, so uh, I really love movies. Um, before, I don't know if you guys saw the meme, but uh, before Will Smith slapped Chris Rock on stage, I used to watch the Oscars because it had a place of honor in cinema. Um, but one of my favorite awards, or the two favorite awards I enjoy looking at is Best Actor or Actress and Best Supporting Actor or Actress. Um, and the reason for that is I feel like the actor, the main person, usually gets all the credit, but the supporting actor or actress also plays a part in helping elevate the movie, right? If you're unfamiliar with the Oscars, I've been told that this is a common trope in K-drama. Usually there's that main character, but there's also kind of like that side character that's not the main character, but the fans love, and they elevate the main character, right? Today, our passage centers around two characters, kind of like a supporting character and the main character. The supporting character being John the Baptist and the main character being Jesus. Um, this isn't taking place in a movie or a K-drama, um, but it's taking place in real life, in history. So as you listen, consider that this really happened and this has effects on our lives today. While well, both Jesus and John, they both had an identity and a message. And that's how we're gonna divide up our sermon today. The two points for today's sermon are, number one, the identity and message of John. The identity and message of John. And number two, the identity and message of Jesus. The identity and message of Jesus. Now, Pastor Kay, he kicked us off last week in our Mark overview sermon, but before we dive into the beginning of Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, I want to request something of you students throughout this series. Throughout this series, and every time you hear the Bible preached, pay close attention. Evaluate every word we read and everything that's preached about what we read, and never take what is said up here at face value. Don't just assume it's true because a pastor says it. Measure it against scripture so you can see for yourself whether you believe in the gospel or not. And if you have questions, don't let a day go by with unanswered questions. Work to answer your questions, addressing your doubts. And with a book, especially like Mark, that moves so quickly where the key word is immediately, it's easy to miss so many things. And I'll do my best to guide you, but you must work with me to understand what God has left for us in this Gospel of Mark. With that said, let's dive into the Gospel of Mark. Turn with me to Mark chapter one, verse one. Mark chapter one, verse one. And if you're there, and if you get there, would you please stand as a sign of reverence for God's word? And if you notice your neighbors having trouble, please help them. Mark chapter one, verse one. We're gonna be in Mark for a while, so please bookmark it so that next week you don't have to spend time riffling through the pages again. Mark chapter one, verse one. And if you don't have a Bible, then share with your neighbor and please still stand up as a sign of reverence for God's word. We'll be reading first from verses one to eight. Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. Let me read that for us. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. 
Now, if we're following the story in the order Mark wrote his gospel, here we first learn about the identity and message of John in these eight verses. And that's our first point, the identity and message of John. John's identity, if you're taking notes, is that he is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Let me say that one more time. John's identity is that he is the last of the Old Testament prophets. How do we know this? We know this because Mark points out two things in these verses. First, he applies an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, to John the Baptist. If you look down at verses two and three, it's not talking about someone random. Mark is talking about John. Mark references Isaiah 40, verse three, which says that before the Savior King comes, before the person who's promised comes, God is going to send a messenger who's going to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. The messenger himself is not the Messiah, but he will be sent by God to announce the coming Messiah. John's identity was to be the messenger, but he was not the son of God. Second, John does ministry in the wilderness. Verse three says, if you look down, the voice of the messenger will come from the wilderness. And if you look at verse four, from where, where is John proclaiming his announcement? Where is he preaching? It's in the wilderness. If you're not convinced and it's just a coincidence to you, then Mark gives us one final clue about who John is through his clothing and through his diet. In verse six, it says, John was clothed with camel's hair, wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And this can seem like random facts, but in a book that moves as quickly as Mark, everything here is intentionally written. So as encouraged, look carefully. Why would Mark talk about John's clothes and his food choices? Is it just to point out how weird he is? No, it's because this reflected the lifestyle of the great Old Testament prophet, Elijah. Elijah. You might be asking, Elijah, who's Elijah? Well, for the purpose of our sermon, all I'll say is he was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets who talked about the coming kingdom. In order order to understand the significance of John the Baptist's role in the Gospel of Mark, we need to lay down some context. So try to follow along with me. I'm actually gonna give a lot of Bible references throughout the sermon, so if you don't understand, I wanna encourage you to just write down the Bible reference and look at it throughout this week. In Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament prophets, it reads in chapter four, verse five, Malachi chapter four, verse five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And this is after Elijah was taken up to heaven. So God is saying he's going to send someone like Elijah before the day of the Lord comes. Now, I didn't know this till this week, but today when, if you have any of you have Jewish friends, maybe you can ask them to fact check me, but today when Jewish people celebrate the Passover, which is a major Jewish holiday, there's always an extra chair in the room that remains empty. No one sits in it. And if you ask whether someone's running late or didn't show up, the devout Jewish person, they would say that the chair is for Elijah. They're still waiting for this promise in Malachi to be fulfilled. But Mark, in chapter one, he is saying it is fulfilled. Elijah has come. He's come in John. He's not literally Elijah, but he is the prophet like Elijah, bearing truth about the coming king. In 2 Kings chapter one, verse eight, Elijah is described as someone who wore a garment of hair with a leather belt around his waist, the same exact dress that John the Baptist wore in Mark chapter one, verse six. And this is consistent with what Jesus says in Matthew eleven fourteen 14 about John. He is Elijah who is to come. John is not literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy in Malachi. Now keep in mind, from Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament, all the way to the start of the New Testament, 
Um, let me just field some guesses. How long do you think that time period was between the end of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament? Anyone have any guesses? How many years? Anyone? I'll take three guesses, just three. Don't be shy. Did you say something? Anyone? 300, close, a little longer. 400, 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. 400 years. So think about that. It's not just that there was no Bible between that, but if you consider the Bible as the word of God, that means the people of God had no prophecy for 400 years. There was silence from God because of the disobedience of, the, of God's people for about 400 years. So when all of a sudden, after all that silence and thinking that God must have abandoned them, and then they heard of a strange man dressed like Elijah that was predicted 400 years before, preaching powerfully in the wilderness, wearing weird clothes, baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins in the Jordan River. You can imagine this caused quite a stir. John the Baptist was trending all over Twitter and YouTube and TikTok. People were probably wondering, is this guy the one? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that we've been waiting for all along? And did God finally answer our prayers after this many years? John's popularity, it was going through the roof and it was not just because he was wearing weird stuff. He looked like the Old Testament prophets and the whole Old Testament from the moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it was all about declaring promises that will be fulfilled in the New Testament. It was filled with promises that pointed forward to the Messiah King, the one who would not only save, but he would also make all things new. And the people of God were waiting on this figure to rescue them. And some must have thought that John, who was preaching boldly, baptizing people, becoming popular, they must have thought that he was the one. And that's why John's message is to clarify that he is not the one. In verse seven and eight, this is what John is saying. He's saying he's simply a messenger. He announces, you may think I'm the one sent by God from heaven, but I'm not the son of God. I'm not the one you've been waiting for. I'm just a passing shadow. There will be someone who comes after me who will do more than just administer a sign for the forgiveness of sin, which is baptism, but he will actually forgive your sins. The one who comes after me is the son of God. And then boom, Jesus, he steps on the scene in verse nine. Now, before we read these verses, I wanna ask, do you know who Jesus is? If a non-Christian were to ask you, hey, who's Jesus? What would you do, what would you say to answer? Do you know what Jesus came to do? Well, Jesus, he didn't come just to teach about moral things. He did not just come to show kindness to his creation. No, he came with a specific message. And this message was about, about himself. And this brings us to our second point, the identity and message of Jesus. The identity and message of Jesus. Let's see what the Bible says about who Jesus really is. Let's read from verse nine to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Before I answer the question, who is Jesus? I wanna see if you guys caught it. I tried to emphasize Jesus' identity as we read. You can look down as well. But who does the Bible say Jesus is in John chapter one? Anyone? It's not a trick question. Someone said it. Anyone? Okay, I heard a whisper. Son, Jesus is the son of God. 
And that's Jesus' identity. He's not a moral teacher. He's not just your friend. He is the son of God. And what's his message? His message is that he's the one that all of the Old Testament and John the Baptist were pointing to. He's the savior king who has come to save and restore his creation. He brought the kingdom near. Now these are bold claims. These are big claims. And I don't miss the pandemic, but I miss playing among us every night with our church. And you know, just because someone claims something as true, I'm innocent, I was at wires. It doesn't mean they're telling the truth. You know that, right? So what in Jesus can we see to know that he's telling the truth? How do we know that Jesus is not sus, right? Well, let's walk through what happens from verses nine to 15, and hopefully you'll see that Jesus is the promised king who came to save his people from their sins and restore the kingdom of God. In verse nine, Jesus is baptized by John, which we'll come back to in a moment, but I first wanna focus on what happens right after. After Jesus is baptized in verses 10 and 11, the father declares the identity of Jesus as the son of God. He calls Jesus his beloved son. Jesus is the son of God. There is no mistaking that. From the beginning of Mark, it's revealed that Jesus is no ordinary man. Mark is trying to set up Jesus as this character who is fully man, but more importantly, fully God. He is fully man and fully God. And it seems like Jesus' identity is clear. But what about his message? Now let's go back to his baptism one more time. If you're thinking this is weird that Jesus is getting baptized, I think you're right. I think you're right because you see earlier in this chapter, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, which is turning away from sin and the forgiveness of sin. If Jesus is really God, he never sinned, so why would he need to be baptized? Well, Jesus being baptized, it actually demonstrates what his message is. Jesus being baptized foreshadows what he must do in order to accomplish what John could not do, but only speak about. And it was to forgive sin. Only God has the authority to forgive sin. For everyone else who went to the Jordan River, baptism was a sign of their spiritual cleansing, their need for a savior. It was a sign they needed a savior to wash them of their sins. But for Jesus, baptism, him being baptized by John was a sign that he is the savior who takes on the sins of everyone else. The sins of the people were washed away symbolically in the Jordan River. But then the polluted water the symbolically polluted water of the Jordan, it was put on to Jesus. Jesus was baptized not because he needed forgiveness of sins, he needed to take on our sins. Why was his baptism necessary? Because someone has to take the punishment for sin. It's either the one who committed sin themselves, so if you're standing here, sitting here, you've sinned and you don't have your faith in Christ, you will have to answer for yourself. It's either the one who's committed sin themselves and it's unforgiven, or the one who is a perfect substitute, or perf perfect substitute, excuse me. And in being baptized, the Son of God is saying, I've come to be that substitute for you. I've come to die on that cross for you, so that whoever believes in me will have more than a symbolic washing of sin in baptism. If you believe in me, what you deserve for everything you've done will be put on to me. And maybe you don't think you deserve this forgiveness from God because you recognize how deep your sin runs. But if you think about the people going to John the Baptist, they're not getting baptized in the city. They're getting baptized in the wilderness because they don't want people to see them in their shame and in their guilt. But they're so desperate to be cleansed of their sin that they'll go to this guy in the wilderness to be baptized. So if you're here and you think you're too far from God's grace, consider that these people went to John in the wilderness. 
you have true forgiveness from God if you go to him in faith. Friends, Jesus' baptism is the message of the cross. As a son of God, he was the perfect substitute. And in his willing and loving sacrifice, if you have faith, you can be forgiven of your sins. Now, what allows Jesus to act as his perfect substitute? We talked about it. It's because he's God. Because he's God, he's sinless. He's spotless. In verses 10 to 11, God says Jesus is his beloved son. Again, everything in Mark is placed here intentionally. What's the significance of God declaring Jesus as his son? Why couldn't he just say, this is God? Why did he have to say, this is my son? Well, the term son is also used by the Gospel Luke in chapter 3, verse 38. And he uses the word son to describe Adam as a son of God, the same Adam that was created in the uh, Garden of Eden. Now, Jesus was not created by God because he is God himself, which is from John chapter 1, but he is the son of God nonetheless. Why is this significant? When Adam was created in Genesis, he was supposed to represent the rest of humanity. He was supposed to represent you and me. So when Adam sinned, the rest of mankind, you and me, we fell. We fell into sin. Adam failed as a son to the father. He disobeyed. He plunged our world into darkness. And every bad thing that you see, experience, and even do yourself, it can be traced back to the first sin, the original sin of Adam. But Christ, he's the true and better son. He's the true and better Adam. Like Adam, he is identified as the son of God. The difference is Christ perfectly obeyed. Christ was sinless. Adam had everything in the Garden of Eden. He had food, he had water, he had shelter, he had dominion over all of creation. And more than that, there was no sin in this world. There was no brokenness in the world. He was in a lush garden, but he still sinned when tempted by the serpent. But Jesus, Jesus was in the wilderness. He was tempted in the wilderness. He was hungry, thirsty, cold, tired. But when tempted by Satan, he remained obedient to God. He remained obedient. No ordinary man could have done what Jesus did in the wilderness, but Jesus was able to because he is the true son of God. Christ is the true and better Adam because while Adam sinned in a lush garden where he had dominion over the animals, Jesus withstood temptation in the wilderness where the animals were untamed and wild and threatening. Jesus is the son of God. That's what Mark is saying in these verses. Jesus is the Messiah King that was promised. John said, he who will be king over you is coming. He's not me, but he's coming. And Jesus says, I am your king. I've come. I will rescue you and redeem you. And this is the message of Jesus, which is called the gospel of God in verse 14. The gospel, for those of you who are familiar with this term, it literally means good news. Does the message that Jesus Christ has saved you of your sins and is making all things new, is that good news to you? Maybe you believe in the gospel with your mind, with your intellect, but you don't find your heart leaping for joy or worshiping when you hear it preached over and over again. In fact, it seems to grow old and you don't want to hear it anymore. You don't understand the hype about heaven. Well, friend, Jesus did die for you to go to heaven, but that's not all he came to do. The reason a lot of us have trouble living as Christians or even looking forward to heaven, I think is because we look at the gospel as a two-chapter story, when in reality, it's a four-chapter story. Let me explain. One chapter is that we believe we've sinned, We've fallen. And the other chapter that we believe is that we've been saved through Jesus. We know we've sinned, but we know we've been saved. 
but we forget the other two chapters that bookend our story. We forget that we were created in the beginning by God for a specific purpose. And we forget that at the end, there will be complete restoration for us at the end. This is how Pastor Jeremy Treat puts it. And so we have to remember that we're created by God. The earth is good and we're fallen. But the story of scripture is not one of removing our souls from earth so that we can dwell in heaven for all of eternity in a disembodied experience. No, scripture is not about taking us from earth to heaven. Did you guys catch that? No, scripture is not just about taking us from earth to heaven. It's about the renewal of heaven and earth under the kingship of Christ. What Pastor Jeremy is saying is that the gospel, it does make a way to heaven. That's correct, but that's not complete. The gospel rescues from hell to heaven for a particular purpose, and we cannot miss this purpose. It's not so we can live however we want, but it's so that we can go back to our created purpose, which was submit to the kingship of Christ as a way to look forward to the new heaven and new earth. So by pursuing holiness, by living as God tells us to, you become renewed as an image bearer of God, the purpose you were created for. And when we get to heaven, if you're walking closely with Christ, you should not feel so out of place. You should feel like you've returned home, that you belong. By loving others right now, you undo the damage that sin has done in their lives with the hope that God would use your every effort to bring them back from the slavery to sin under the reign of King Jesus. By participating in the work left to the church by Jesus to proclaim his name to the ends of the earth, you're announcing the king has arrived and his kingdom is here. When announcements like this are made, the announcements that John and ultimately Jesus make, there is no middle ground. You're forced to take a stand. In the olden days, when you study history, there are a bunch of kings. and They would send messengers to villages declaring the kingship of the kingdom. And then the people would have to decide, am I gonna follow this king or not? There was no middle ground and it's the same for Christians. The Christian hears the word of the king and they submit to the king. The Christian is the one who loves the king, who submits to the king, who obeys the king because they believe in what he's doing and they believe in him. The one saved by the king proclaims the king. They seek to know the king by studying his word. They love the king by obeying him and doing what he asks, sacrificing everything in the process because they believe it's worth it. So if you're Christian here today, let me ask you, do you love your king? Do you love your king? It's not about doing or not doing things, but love. I believe some of you do. Some of you are growing in spiritual maturity and it really encourages me. And it, you guys take steps out of faith to obey Christ that you never took before. But you find life is getting not easier, but actually harder when you follow Jesus. It's lonely at school when no one else seems to be Christian or the one that say they're Christian don't actually act like they're Christian or they don't take their walk with Jesus seriously. Being a Christian feels lonely, especially on your school campus. Let me remind you, Christian, you belong to the King of Heaven. You are not a citizen of this world, but of the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter or it sucks if you don't always fit in at school, but a part of me can't help but thank God and take you not fitting in as confirmation that your identity is that of a follower of Jesus, that you are not a worldly citizen, but you are a kingdom citizen. So if you feel out of place at school, embrace that. Take comfort in the faith that God has given to you. And if you're not a Christian, I want to express, we're glad you're here so you can hear the message of the gospel of God clearly. Maybe you're on the fence because you're unsure. 
Maybe being under a king seems limiting both in terms of life and happiness, but don't be mistaken. Everyone has a king. If it's not Jesus, it's something or someone else. Everyone has a king. And you might be wondering, no, I don't. We live in a democracy. We vote for our president. I don't have a king. Well, here are these words from David Foster Wallace, who is an atheist. This is not a Christian speaking, so consider his words about kingship and worship. This is his words. I'm quoting, everybody worships. Everybody has a king. The only choice we get is what we worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else in your worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things and success, if they are where you, you tap your real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel like you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power. You will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to numb your own fear of losing it. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out for how much you don't know, end quote. What is your king? Is it fame, beauty, pleasure, academic success, influence, reputation, power? Whatever it is, let me humbly ask, are you satisfied with your current king? Or does it feel more like a cruel master or slave driver demanding more and more of your humanity so, that not, you, so not that you can flourish, but so you can barely survive? Sooner or later, you'll find there is no king like King Jesus. There is no king as loving, sacrificial, humble, meek, gentle, patient, merciful, life-giving as King Jesus. There is no kingdom besides God's that will last forever. Consider the full extent of living under your current king. And may the Holy Spirit help you see that they all pale in comparison or they don't measure up to King Jesus. And if you are in a place where you realize you've gone your life ignoring your sins and rejecting your, the kingship and authority of Christ, look down at verse 15. These words are for you. These are Jesus' words for you. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What's required for you to belong to this kingdom is not to do some sort of work, to not show some sort of ultimate remorse or pay off your own debt, but it's understanding that Christ's words are true, his kingdom is here, and all you need to do is repent and believe in the gospel. Crosses, Jesus is the promised king who brought the kingdom of God, and the kingdom is here. The announcement first came over 2,000 years ago, but it's still true today, and that's why we announce it every Sunday as the gospel of God. Trust and obey Jesus as your king and live in light of his kingdom. Let's pray.